Hey all. Hello. What do we got? Can you hear me? Four. I can hear you. Okay. Where are you? Can hear me. I'm in my backyard. <laughs> it's so sunny there. Where? But where? Where in the world are you? I'm in the Bay Area. Oh. It's, it's quite nice. sunny actually. It was raining like all day yesterday. Yeah, it's raining here. It's not very nice. Yeah. Catherine's turned into a picture. Oh no. Yeah, she said she couldn't hear me. So I think oh. she must be troubleshooting. Yeah, oh I can hear you. That's good. Okay. Jack's an anime character. <laughs> Matthew. Matthew's just a hand because his laptop screen won't won't turn down. There we go. It's a mess. I can't really adjust its location. Aww. All right, we're almost all here. What do we got? Where's so Brady Bunch? You're in the gallery view here. Oh, no, he's somebody. <laughs> Oh, that's even better. Jacob, I love it. We'll give it a minute. We, we at least let have to let Catherine Give Catherine a chance to troubleshoot. Guess I can start up my iPad. In there. What do we got? Uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got nine. We're almost at quorum. We'll just start whenever Catherine can get back to us. Oh, Catherine's back. Riley's with us. I think we're good. Catherine, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right, cool. All right, I think we've hit quorum then. Oh, let's get started. Let's just jump right into it. We, um, we're picking up on um, the last part of this lecture on discrete curvature. Oh, I had the wrong one up. No, wait a minute. I do have the wrong one up. Give me a minute here. Shoot, how do I end this? Wait. What did that happen? Better. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, this is labeled discrete curvature two variational. So Keenan's original uh, kind of pacing of this course had two lectures on discrete curvature. And as I said last time, he, he's teaching this class at the same time and he's posting his lectures as well. And I'm sticking links to those up on our Piazza page. So under the video section, you'll see I've been labeling them Backman and Crane for the lectures I've been, the videos of the lectures I've been giving and the videos of the lectures he's been giving. So if you have the time or you're confused, you want another resource, feel free to watch his. So he's, he squeezed everything we did in the last two class days into one lecture. So he's going at a at kind of a faster pace. Um, and today, actually, we're doing his second lecture on discrete curvature. And he's been revising his slides as he's been posting these things. So the lecture he'll see him do um, is on a newer set of slides than what I'm doing because I'm basing it on his slides from last year. And he actually added a bunch of stuff at the end that's super interesting and will come up next time. So I'm hoping I get through this today with about 15 minutes to spare. And then I actually want to play you the last 15 minutes of the video that he made of his last class because it's on new material and he does a good job with it. There's no reason for me to redo that. And he's got some nice animations and I don't have any, I'm not set up for that. So um, let's just jump right into it. I don't think this, I think we'll easily have those 15 minutes at the end. I don't think there's a lot of content we're gonna cover today. Um, where the point today is to just go through the missing arrows, which are just these vertical arrows in the first two columns. And the arrows on the left side under the smooth category there, I'm not even gonna prove those. We're just gonna basically state them. I'm just, I'm more gonna just explain to you what those arrows mean rather than prove those. And the arrows in the center column, we are gonna prove, but these are, these are what Keenan calls geometric proofs. We're not writing out algebraic proofs. So there's a lot of, there's some hand waving, um, but, but it, you can make these arguments rigorous. I don't wanna downplay these arguments. And actually this more geometric kind of hand waving is a lot more intuitive and builds up your intuition a lot better. I think it is a better way to do it, the way, the way he has this structured. So um, we'll go through it. The nice thing I like about it is if, if you believe by the end of the lecture that that middle column of arrows is true, then it partly justifies the left column in the smooth category because the discrete category is supposed to completely mirror the smooth category. So even though we're not proving those things in the smooth category, the fact that, that we are proving them in this discrete category makes this picture look a lot nicer. Really, everything kind of fits together better. Um, as I said, the, the whole idea here to justify all those arrows in, the, in, in all those columns is um, something called a, a geometric derivative. So remember, a derivative is just a rate of change. So we're going to look at how a rate of change, how a geometric quantity changes. And we're, we're going to take the derivative, like usually in calculus, you have like f of x. And you say, how does f of x change when you vary x, right? Here we're looking at how a geometric quantity changes as you vary a geometric parameter. So we might say, how does this area change as we vary this length? Or how does this volume change as we vary this position? Right, so we're varying a geometric thing with another geometric thing. And then rather than doing calculus type arguments or algebraic type arguments, we can do completely geometric arguments to understand how things vary with respect to each other. So, he, so he's got some examples here and we're gonna go through these in examples in general. Um, so you know, what, an example on this slide is how, how does like area change um, for a triangle as you move the position of its vertices. Um, you know, that's this, this question in the middle here. What's the gradient of triangle area? It's really asking how does the area change as you change the procedure of the vertices? We could write down, I just wanna emphasize here, and he emphasizes this too. We could write down the position of all the vertices of the triangle, x, y, z, a, b, c, um, U, V, W. And then we can write down the area as some formula of all of those variables. And then we can use calculus to actually take partial derivatives and compute gradients of the area with respect to all those. So you could do this completely algebraically, completely calculus-wise. And you can see, like, even if you use a computer to help you, that's just a mess. All right, so here's just a quick screenshot of somebody typing this in. 
there are those three vertices and coordinates, right? And then somewhere on this page is the area as a function of those nine numbers. And then somebody asked Mathematica to actually compute the gradient in terms of those nine numbers. It's this complete mess of calculations. You don't want to do it that way. It doesn't lead to any intuition. It's not human readable, right? Rather than doing that, we want to do something more intuitive. Um, here's this example. Oh, terribly like this example is the first one to get started, but we got to do this anyway. So um, the point here is if I want to vary that angle theta, right? Theta is the thing we're trying to vary, and we're trying to vary that by changing the position of A, okay? Now, if you think of A as the position of A as a vector space, you could choose whatever basis you want for that vector space. So the positions of A are spanned by two directions, one direction that way and one direction that way. Any motion of A can be decomposed into some linear combination of V and W, right? Some amount of V plus some amount of W gives me a motion of A, right? Now the gradient, the only thing to know about gradient is it's a linear operator. So the rate of change of A in, um, let's say I want the gradient of theta as I move A in some direction like V plus W. That's just gonna be the gradient in the V direction as I move A in the V direction plus the gradient as I move A in the W direction. Any motion of A can be decomposed to a motion in the V direction, a motion in the W direction. That means the gradient will break up into a gradient in the V direction plus some gradient in the W direction. But the point is, if W really is in this, in this direction, kind of in the radial direction, then that angle theta doesn't change if I move A in the W direction. Everybody see that? I mean, it should be, again, we're just, relying on your intuition, just staring at this picture. If I pull A directly away from the center of that circle in the radial direction, then theta doesn't change. So this is zero, right? The gradient of theta as I move A in the W direction is zero. So I only have to analyze the rate of change of theta if I move A in the tangential direction to the circle. Right, so V is supposed to be tangent to the circle. And now, now we can kind of go through his argument here. He says, well, how much does it change if I move A tangentially? Well, imagine you keep doing that and you go all the way around the circle. Well, then theta has changed a full two pi as I move that point all the way around the circle. Now, all the way around the circle means I move that point two pi r in length, okay? So I've changed theta by an angle of two pi when I've gone two pi r in length. So the rate of change is just that ratio, two pi over two pi r, okay? That's just one over r, and r is the magnitude of b minus a. So that one over magnitude of b minus a, that's what you're seeing right over here in his text. Okay, now um, what you're seeing, this formula at the bottom that you're seeing here, uh, first of all, there is a little two up there in the corner that uh, I think was added kind of after the fact. <laughs> so, um, and there's also a J that you'll see. J appeared in one of the slides of an earlier lecture. We're gonna see J a lot more next week. J was 90 degree rotation, okay? So you take um, a minus b over the magnitude of a minus b. That's just a unit vector in the a minus b direction, right? And then j of that means we rotate that 90 degrees. So now we're pointing in the v direction, right? If we take the radius and rotate it 90 degrees, now it's a tangent vector, okay? So that's j of a minus b over magnitude a minus b. That's just a unit vector and that's just a fancy way to write a unit vector in the tangential direction. But now we have to multiply that by this quantity one over B minus A. I think that square should just be on the denominator actually. Right, so if I take J of A minus B over A minus B magnitude, 
that's a unit vector in the tangential direction, and I'm multiplying that by one over r, which is one over the magnitude of b minus a. So I think this, this square should just be on the bottom. That's more complicated than some of the other examples we do. That's probably the most exa complicated example of a geometric derivative we'll do. We'll do some other ones. If you didn't follow that, don't worry about it too much because we'll, we'll see some, some nicer ones. Um, triangle area, I think, is a much easier one to get your head around. Just the gradient of triangle area. And the only thing we're going to vary here is the position of this point P. Right? Before we do this, let's just think about um, he has things labeled in a certain way. Let's do this somewhat more basically. I have this point, um, I have this triangle, and the area of this triangle is, you should all know, it's one half base times height. Yes? Okay, now again, this point P that's on top, I can vary it in the direction straight to the right parallel to the base, or I can vary it perpendicular to the base. Any motion of P can be broken up into motions parallel and perpendicular to the base. So you can think about those derivatives differently. How does the area change as I move that point parallel to the base? Think about how the base and the height change if I move things in this W direction. We have answers there? If I move parallel, I don't have my chat window up. There it is. If I move that point at the tip parallel to the base, then how do the base and the height of that triangle change? Doesn't change. They don't change at all, right? The height of the triangle stays the same, and the base of the triangle stays the same. So I don't even have to think about the derivative in that direction. The only direction I have to think about the derivative is in the direction perpendicular to the base in this v direction, okay? Now, the only thing that's changing as I move in the v direction is h, okay? So the derivative of 1 half b h in the h direction, what's the derivative of h with respect to h? Just one? Just one, right? So the derivative of 1 half bh with respect to h, the derivative of this with respect to h is just 1 half b, which is 1 half the length of the base. So if you think about all possible motions of that tip point, the way the gradient, now gradient, okay, let's remind you what gradient is. Gradient is of a function points uphill. Okay, we're going to see this a lot more next time. That means the gradient tells you how to increase that function the fastest. So if I'm thinking about area of the triangle and I want to know how do I increase the area of this triangle the fastest, it's saying I move in the direction of h and the rate of change of the area when I do that is this quantity one half b. Okay, it's a very geometric argument, right? There's very little algebra here. I did a tiny bit of calculus, but I'm really just talking this through and drawing pictures. And that's what we mean by these geometric arguments doing geometric derivatives. All right, now that's just in two dimensions. In three dimensions, I have to think of a way to describe the base and the direction perpendicular to the base, but everything's three dimensional now. So the normal is to this triangle is right here. It's that dot is, means it's pointing straight at me. The normal is coming straight at you, okay? And E is the edge, that's the base of the triangle. If I take the cross product of the normal vector, this unit normal vector with E, now I get this vector that's pointing at right angles to both N and E, that's pointing in the direction of the height, okay? So that's a vector in the direction of the height, but the length of that vector is the length of E, which is the base of the triangle. With the length of N cross E, is exactly the base of the triangle. So that's a vector, n cross e is a vector that points in the direction of the height and its length is the base. And the rate of change is supposed to be half the base, right? And so the gradient is half of n cross e. 
Got it? N cross C captures two things. It's a vector corner. Its magnitude is the length of the base. Its direction is in the direction of the height of the triangle. And the half just comes from the original formula for the area of a triangle, which is one half base times height. Got it? All right. Um, these kind, we're not going to go through every one of these arguments. These kind of arguments can be used to do lots of different geometric derivatives. So for example, you can look at the gradient of the dihedral angle with respect to various motions of those two triangles where the two triangles meet. That's the dihedral angle. Okay? And he just gives away the answer. This is the gradient that you get. Um, you can, we've already done this one. This is a three-dimensional vector version of the rate of change of, what is that, n, the normal, the normal version. That's similar to the one we did where we looked at the rate of change of the angle, the gradient of the angle. Um, we just did this one. The gradient of the area is one half the normal vector crossed with the edge vector. Um, and there's, there's other ones. Here's a more complicated one. Honestly, don't even know what that is. That's something. All right, let's ignore that. One more piece of the puzzle we're going to need before we get back into talking about discrete curvature is called the Schlafly formula. Um, Keenan threw this slide in, and there's no justification for it whatsoever. And I said, I don't know the proof of this, so I'm just going to explain this slide, and I have no idea why it is, but we're going to use it later. Um, all this is saying is that if I have any kind of simplicial complex, and I think about moving the vertices in any direction I want. Um, the only thing you have to worry about is keeping all the lengths constant. As long as all the lengths of all the edges are constant, but you move all the vertices, what you're going to end up changing is the dihedral angles. Now, you may think, well, how can you possibly move the vertices and not change the dihedral angles? Just imagine you take a sphere and you kind of flatten it. Then the lengths of all the edges, if you imagine the sphere is triangular, the lengths of all the edges may stay the same. It's just the angles between the faces that will change. Okay, you can imagine lots of, or a cube, if you, if you take a cube and you skew that cube, you take the top face and the bottom face and push them against each other, um, the, the two faces will get closer together. Imagine the, the, the edges of the cube are made out of rigid rods. There's all kinds of motions you could do. Cubes are kind of floppy. If you actually take, take a bunch of straws, do this at home. Take a bunch of straws, make a cube out of a bunch of straws. You can still do lots of things to that cube. You can skew it and twist it without changing the lengths of those edges. What will change is the lengths of the dihedral angles, those angles between the faces. Okay. Then the Schlafly formula is just saying that if you compute the rate of change of those angles and multiply those rates of change by the edge lengths and add that up, you always get zero, which is kind of amazing. I don't know why this is true. I need to think about this more to understand why this is true. Um, so whenever you encounter a new formula, there's two things you have to do. First, you have to understand what the formula is saying, and then you should understand where it comes from. I'm hoping I just at least helped you with the first part. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does everybody understand this formula? Well, at least what it's saying? We have some idea? All right. We're going we're gonna to come back to that. So just put that aside. We're going to come back to that Schlafly formula. We're just going to need it in about 10 minutes. Okay, it's going to come up One later. Question. Yeah. Uh, is it like <clears throat> you're moving i and j in any direction and this equation always holds true? Correct. Yeah. You're moving these vertices in any direction you want. And if you keep track of the rates of change of all the dihedral angles, and you compute this big sum, you just always get zero, no matter how you move things. OK, that's really cool. Um, all right, let's see, we're going back. All right, curvature variations. Um, this is the whole point of today's lecture, is to think about how broader geometric quarters. So we just talked about the area of a triangle, or the dihedral angle between two triangles. But what about a whole surface? If I want to change the area of the whole surface, how does that change? Or how does the volume enclosed by a whole surface change? What if I take the gradient of volume among all possible motions of the surface? 
what's the most, the fastest way you could increase the volume of that surface? That would be the gradient of the volume. Or if I take the total mean curvature over the whole surface, what can I do to that surface to increase the total mean curvature as fast as possible? Okay, and that's what's on this slide. Um, there's not, again, not much of a derivation on this slide. This is just a statement that you should try to digest a little bit. Those variations are down here at the bottom of the screen. And what this is saying, that little delta is exactly supposed to mean these variations that we're talking about. We change the volume in the most efficient way possible. The way you do that is by moving in the normal direction. You take every point of the surface, move it in the normal direction, and that's how you change the volume as fast as possible. Okay. Um, if you want to change the area as fast as possible, it turns out it's not as simple as just moving it in the normal direction. That's a, a little counterintuitive. I would think the area definitely gets bigger if you move all the points in the normal direction, but that's not the fastest way to increase area. The fastest way to increase area is to move every point in the direction of the normal times the mean curvature at that point. So some points are going to move in the normal direction faster than others, depending on the relative sizes of the mean curvatures at each of those points. Okay, that's the fastest way to increase area. Uh, then the next line, the fastest way to increase the total mean curvature is to also move every point in the normal direction, but you've got to scale those normal directions by the Gaussian curvature. And the fastest way to increase the total Gaussian curvature, there's no way to do it. <laughs> no matter how you try to increase the Gaussian curvature, it will stay constant, the total Gaussian curvature will stay constant. And that's the gauss bonnet theorem. The gauss bonnet theorem says that the total Gaussian curvature is a function of the Euler characteristic. And no matter how you deform the surface, the Euler characteristic doesn't change. All right, so that's all these lines right here. That's why I have them all in red, because we just, actually even this one too, we just discussed, I didn't prove, but we just, Keenan's just asserting, hey, just believe these, these are the ways to um, change the volume and the total area and the total mean curvature and the total Gaussian curvature. So you get, if you want to change the volume as fast as possible, you move it in the normal direction. If you want to change the total area as fast as possible, you move it in the mean curvature times the normal direction. Really, we want to spend most of our time understanding these arrows. Okay, those we will prove, but we're going to prove them using these ideas, these geometric derivatives ideas that I talked about at the beginning. Okay, and we'll see that, that in the discrete world, everything that we just claim was true in the smooth world, we'll see proofs that, that that actually does work in the discrete world. So the very first one is this, this top one right here. We're going to think about total volume. That's just total volume and how total volume changes if you try to change it in the fastest way possible. How, do you, how, how can you try to change the total volume of a simplicial surface in the fastest way possible? Um, in the smooth category, the way was, remember going back, in the smooth category, the fastest way to change volume is to move in the normal direction. But the key here is that we don't have a well-defined normal at the vertices of a simplicial surface. So we're going to turn this problem around and we're going to say, hey, let's define the normal at each vertex to be the direction you have to go if you want to change the volume as fast as possible. So we're using the results from the smooth category to justify a definition of normal in the discrete category. That's all he's saying on this slide is we're going to pick the direction that changes volume as fast as possible and we're going to call that the normal direction. All right, so let's just think about how this works in the smooth category before we do it in the discrete category. So um, I'm going to squeeze a lot of stuff onto this slide here. Um, first, you should remember what the volume of a pyramid is. Um, if we have B is the area of the base, B is now area, not length. And H, H is the height of this pyramid. Then the volume 
is one third base times height. Look familiar? Hope that looks familiar. Okay, now again, we can move this point at the very tip in several different directions. So we can move it in a direction somehow parallel to the base. There's two directions now parallel to the base, right? Because the base is two dimensional. Or we can move it perpendicular to the base. If we move it parallel to the base, we're not changing the area of the base or the height. So the volume doesn't change. So we don't have to think about how does the volume change as we move things parallel to the base. The fastest way to increase volume is to just move it perpendicular, uh, yeah, perpendicular to the base. Right? That's the direction where h changes. And the rate of change of volume is therefore the derivative of this thing with respect to h, which is just one third b. Okay? So the rate of change of volume of the pyramid is one third the area of the base. That's the rate of change. And it, that's the rate of change when you increase volume as fast as possible. And the way to increase volume as fast as possible is to do that in a direction perpendicular to the base. It's just like we did with triangles, right? <laughs> um, now, in three dimensions, so now I've got this triangle here that I've just drawn over. Let's get rid of all this stuff. Okay, now let's, the pyramid we're talking about is the pyramid in this picture right here, right? H is, I take, so this point right here, he doesn't have a label, but that point on the surface, he's calling F. F is the point on the surface. So F minus P is this vector. Okay. Now that vector F, the base of this triangle is up here. There's the base. Right, so it's a little tiny patch of area on the surface and we're gonna call that little infinitesimal patch of area DA. So the area of the base is DA, okay? And there's this line that connects this point P inside the surface to this point F on the surface, that's F minus P. But F minus P is not the height of that pyramid. Right? I want the height of that pyramid is the component of F minus P in the normal direction to the base. That's why he's dotting with N to get the height down here. You take the component of F minus P in the normal direction to the surface and you get the height of that pyramid. All right? And then again, the actual, um, the actual volume Sorry, we haven't done, we're not up to the gradient yet. I jumped ahead a little bit. The volume is one third the base times the height. The height is here, okay? The base, the area of the base is dA. And so we get this quantity right here if we want the total volume. Now we gotta integrate that to get the total volume, right? So that's just the integral of one third the base times the height when we integrate that, we get the total volume enclosed by the surface. We're just adding up all these little pyramids. Okay, so that's total volume. And that, oh, sorry, that simplifies to this quantity here when we break it, the integral up over that subtraction. One of the interesting things to note there, it doesn't matter where you put that point P. That point P drops out of the calculation, which it should. The volume shouldn't depend on what point you pick in the interior to calculate the volume, right? You just get one third times F dot N, DA is the total volume. Um, so again, on the previous slide, in the smooth category, we got the volume is one third times the integral of F dot N, DA. That's what we got in the smooth category. To do this in the discrete category, you could do all the same stuff. Um, F is right here. The integral turns into the summation, okay? Um, N is, if I want N dot D, N D A, N D A, 
I need a normal vector. Oh, the way I'm going to get a normal vector is I'm going to take two edge vectors and take their cross product. Right? So that's where fj cross fk comes in. But the magnitude of that cross product is going to be the area of this parallelogram. So I got to take half that to get the, the something that points in the normal direction but has the right area of that triangle. So that's why this one third became a one sixth is because there's this extra factor of two that comes in, of one half that comes in there. Uh, I'm sorry, could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Previous slide? Yeah. Oh, thanks. So uh, what, what, what exactly is P? Like, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a zero form. Uh, what, what is what? Sorry, Sigurd. What is P? P is just a point in the center of the, this surface. F, F is also a point. F is a point on the surface. We're going to integrate over all possible values of F. Uh, so what is, what is the point dot product uh, uh, N? Oh, good question. Yeah, so <laughs> um, one of the things that gets very confusing in differential geometry, and honestly, I get confused a lot at this a lot, is the distinction between points and vectors because there isn't one. <laughs> a point is just a thing with three coordinates and a vector is a thing with three coordinates. So any algebra you learn for dot products, cross products, for vectors, you can use a point then. Um, another way to say it is somewhere in this picture there's an origin. So the point P is the same as the vector that points from the origin to P. Right, if P is the point one comma two comma three, then you could also think of P as a vector from the origin, and that vector is one comma two comma three. So you can take dot products of points just by thinking of them as vectors. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right, so back on that previous slide, we have this formula, one six times the sum of Fi dot Fj cross Fk. Um, now we're looking at how do we change that volume as efficiently as possible, right? That's the gradient. And we're only gonna think about what is the fastest way to change that if I move this one particular point, okay? If I move that one particular point, then Fj cross Fk is constant. So I have the rate of change that you can think of that as like a derivative in the Fi direction of Fi times a constant, okay? And when you do that, the Fi drops out and you're just left with the constant. Right, so that's just the derivative calculation there. And the Fi dropped out because we're looking at the rate of change in the Fi direction. The rate of change of Fi in the Fi direction is just one. So the Fi has dropped out of that, okay? Um, now this, one six times Fj cross Fk, well, that was just what we got for um, our area expression. This is exactly when we did this. This was F one sixth Fj cross Fk. Right. So this exactly justifies this first arrow right here. The way you change volume as quickly as possible is to do that by changing by the sum of the a, j, n, i's. Now I've got to remember, a, n, i is a vector. a, j is an area, it's the area um, of, uh, it was actually the area of the dual cell to vertex j, okay? So we're adding up all these areas, all these dual cells, multiplying them by these normal vectors, and that gives you um, the fastest way to, increase the volume. I think that one's actually harder to get your head around the others, partly because the next one isn't really justified at all, um, but it is a proof you can write down. The next one we're gonna look at is this one right here. We're gonna ask how do we change area as quickly as possible? Uh, and 
again, the area is just going to be the sum of all the areas of all the triangles. So this is the area of AJK. If I add up all the areas of all the triangles, then I just get the total area. Okay. And now there's a question, how do I change area as quickly as possible? And again, just going back, we're only doing that by changing one vertex. We're going to keep all the other vertices fixed. And we're saying, if I just change this one vertex, how do I change the total area as quickly as possible? Okay. Well, if you just think about all the triangles incident into that vertex, here's a triangle incident to that vertex, here's a triangle incident to that vertex, here's a triangle into that incident to that vertex. And all these triangles are touching that vertex. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that vertex and I'm going to think about the gradient of the area of just this one triangle as I move that vertex. And then I'm going to think about the gradient of the area of just this one triangle as I move that vertex. And the total gradient is just the sum of all those little gradients. And we've already thought about the gradient of the area of a triangle. Right? There's the gradient of the area of a single triangle as I move the tip of that triangle. So I know how to compute the gradient of the area of each triangle. I just use this formula. And then the total gradient is what happens when I sum up all of these over all those triangles incident to I. And that turns out by some algebraic trigonometric magic to just be the cotan formula yet again. That cotan formula keeps popping up over and over again. This is not that hard to prove. This is something that I have gone through the derivation of, and you can all do it. It's not that hard. It's algebra, trigonometry, geometry at a high school level. Uh, you just have to remember that cotangent is the ratio of the opposite of the opposite side over the adjacent side, and it's just basic geometry. Okay, it's not that hard. I don't really have time to do it. I don't think Keaton felt like he had time to do it, so there's no slides justifying this. But that's the point: is when you add up all those area triangle area gradients, you get an answer that is given to you by that cotan expression. Okay, and that is exactly what we're seeing right here. If I want to move the area as fast as possible, I do that by something that depends on the cotan formula. Um, I want to emphasize something that I'm realizing is confusing about all three of these. This quantity at the very top, that volume right there, is the volume of the whole surface. The next one down there you look at that summation, I can't write on the slide anymore because I'm out of presentation mode, but that next one down there, look at that, what that summation is taken over. Let's say that summation is taken over all vertices adjacent to vertex I. So that summation is just talking about one vertex. It's just taught, once you sum over all those vertices adjacent to vertex I, then you're just getting a quantity that only depends on vertex i. So that top formula is total volume of the whole object. That second formula is just something that depends on one vertex, just vertex i. So what this is saying is, if I want to change the total volume as fast as possible, I move that one single vertex, vertex i, in this one direction given by this formula. Okay. That n sub i, n of i there in the, on the bottom of the summation, that stands for neighborhood of i. If any of you have had any analysis, um, you know the word neighborhood. That's just all the points are right around it. It should really be the link of i or something, really, to be precise, I think, not the neighborhood of i. Um, and then going down, this last formula we just justified, the first thing there, the, the top thing, is the total area of the whole surface. When I add up all the triangles all over the whole surface, okay, and I'm saying, how do I change that area as fast as possible? By just moving vertex i. And the answer is, you just sum up the gradients of the triangle areas just around for those triangles around vertex i. And what we get is some sense of a normal at vertex i. Right, this is a vector expression. Fj minus Fi is a vector. If I sum up a bunch of vectors, I get another vector. Okay, and that vector that I'm getting is what we're going to call the mean curvature vector. Points in a different direction to the normal.
Okay, and then we're going to do the same thing down here on the bottom. We're going to look at how to vary um, the mean curvature, the total mean curvature. This is this is the total. This is the discrete expression for the total mean curvature. We're going to say how do I vary the discrete mean curvature as fast as possible by just moving vertex i. So we're only going to look at things that involve the simplices right around vertex i. That's why the summation is taken over just the vertices in the neighborhood of vertex i. Okay. Um, again, I mean, this is coming from the Steiner polynomial, the stuff we did last time. Our notion of discrete mean curvature is the summation. We're summing the dihedral angle, the angles between every pair of triangles times the length of that edge that occurs between those pair of triangles. When we sum that over all pairs of triangles, we get um, some sense, some discrete measure of the total mean curvature. And if we want to vary that in the fi direction, if we want to vary fi actually in all possible directions, and say in what direction does the mean curvature change the most, that gives us the gradient, okay? And what we're doing, what he's doing from the first line to the second line there is basically the product rule. The gradient of the product of two quantities is the gradient of the first times the second plus the first times the gradient of the second. Okay, so we've got the gradient of L phi is the gradient of L times phi plus L times the gradient of phi. And this is where we use the Schlafly formula that the gradient of phi, that's the rate of change of phi keeping L fixed. So if we change the dihedral angles but keep L fixed, that total doesn't change at all. And if you have a quantity that doesn't change at all, its gradient is zero. Okay, so that's why this, this term here drops out because of that Schlafly formula that we never justified. What we're left with is just the first term. And another way to write the first term is what's here in that last line. Um, this, uh, let me use a different color here. This quantity right here, that's the gradient of Li. That's asking how do I change Li as fast as possible? And you do that by moving Fi in the direction of Fi minus Fj. Right, that's the point is if you, if I wanna change Li as much as possible, I should move Fi directly away from Fj. I would not move Fi in that direction, right? Don't do that. Because that doesn't change Li at all. You only move it in this direction. So that's why the gradient turned into Fi minus Fj, because that's the direction in which you change the length of um, Lij fastest. Gradient should be in the direction of fastest change. All right, and then again, that's what we're seeing down here, is that if we want to change the total mean curvature, right, our discrete expression for the total mean curvature is here, and if we want to change that as fast as possible, we do that by summing this quantity over all of the things adjacent to i. Professor? What's up, Kaylee? Could you uh, go back a slide and explain again why the uh, term dropped in the second line? Yeah, that was this, uh, I can't undo anything, shoot. Uh, that was the Schlafly formula. The Schlafly formula said that if I change the dihedral angle, but I keep all the lanes fixed, then when I do that summation, I always get zero. That's, it just came out of this other theorem that we never justified. It's not a great answer. I wish I had a better answer for you. It became zero no, it's all because, good. because earlier Keenan said it was zero by some formula. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, just to, just to double check. So if you change the dihedral angle but keep all the lengths the same for some reason, um, the gradient yeah. becomes zero? The, yeah, the gradient is just rate of change, a rate of change in the fastest possible way. But no matter yeah. how you change it, you get zero. So in the fastest way you can change it, you'll get zero. Right? Okay, but okay. That's why the, the dis distinction between like gradients and derivatives is a little bit fuzzy. 
both derivative, a derivative is a rate of change. A gradient is also a rate of change. It's just a specific rate of change in the fastest possible way you can change things. Right. So, so gradients right. satisfy the product rule because they're really just like a, a kind of derivative. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sure. Okay, last thing to justify here, and then I think we're actually done, and we easily have 15 minutes to look at the last 15 minutes of Keenan's last lecture. Uh, the last thing to justify is this last arrow down here. This expression just above it, that's our notion for the total Gaussian curvature. And that was easy. Um, another way to write that was just the sum of the angle defects. That's a much easier way to read it. Omega i was just the angle defects. So this is just the sum of all the angle defects. You look at every vertex, you look at the sum of those tip angles of all the triangles around that vertex, and you check how different is that from 2 pi. Remember, that was the angle defect at that vertex. And then you add that up over all vertices. Okay, And um, that turned out to be just the Euler characteristic. That's equivalent to computing the Euler characteristic. It's got a discrete version of the gauss binet theorem. And the point is that's constant. No matter how I move any one vertex, that sum of v minus e plus f doesn't change. And so no matter how I change things, the total mean curvature doesn't change, which means the gradient of an unchanging quantity has to be zero. So that means, that explains why we get this zero down here, is no matter how I try to change the Gaussian curvature, it's constant, so no matter how I try to change it, the rate of change will be zero. Okay, this, this completes the story. That's everything. This is the last slide of all three lectures, is you're supposed to kind of come away with some understanding of this big picture. I don't think it's so under important that you understand every single arrow in this picture and where it comes from and that you can derive it. But I'm hoping what you've got out of this is just really this kind of grand perspective that have everything relates to everything else. You've got these discrete quantities that mirror these smooth quantities. You can vary the discrete quantities in different ways, and that relates those discrete quantities together. Those are the vertical arrows. These analogs between the smooth category and the discrete category, those are the horizontal arrows. And then the stuff on the right-hand side is a completely different approach to deriving these discrete quantities coming from the Steiner polynomial that we saw last time. And everything ties together. That Steiner polynomial is really what ties together these different chunks of this picture. Any final questions before we watch the last 15 minutes of um, Keenan's lecture? You good? All right. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share and then I'm going to look for Keenan's last lecture. So give me just one minute. Um, oh, did I already post it? I think I already posted it to Piazza. So it should be easy to find. Uh, do, do, do. Let me share, I'll, I'll share my screen, desktop too. Can you all see my screen where I type pizza by accident? And by the smiles, I'm, I, I'm, I'm guessing you're at the command that I can't type today. Piazza. Typing is just really hard when other people are watching you. Yeah, hate it. Let's see. All right. So, um, by the way, the lecture that I just gave is here under lecture notes that I already uploaded this just before class. If we go down to lecture videos, um, discrete curvature Steiner's the video from my last lecture and discrete curvature variational is Keenan doing this exact same lecture with updated slides. So you probably should watch his too. Um, and he added some stuff at the end and model nice. Let me back off a little. Yeah, so this is some stuff he added at the end. 
Everybody see that? It says curvature flow. I hope you can hear the audio when I hit play. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear the audio. Okay, I'm going to hit play. We can play around with is something called curvature flow. So curvature flow is a tool that is used throughout differential geometry for lots of purposes for understanding surfaces and manifolds. It shows up in physics, in relativity, and so forth. Um, from an applied point of view, we can use curvature flow to process surfaces. So one very common task would be, I have some surface, maybe it has noise in it because it was scanned, or maybe it just has features that I don't like and I want to smooth out the surface. Or I want to smooth it out to actually model nice looking features for some surface that I'm building. The basic strategy, the basic algorithm for a discrete curvature flow, or at least the most simple algorithm is to go to every vertex of the mesh, compute some kind of curvature quantity, maybe some curvature vector, move the surface in the normal direction with speed proportional to curvature, so just move along this vector, and then repeat. For this new surface, compute that quantity again. Do it over and over again. Okay. Because of the way that we've developed and, and talked about curvature, we can really understand these curvature flows from a variational perspective. So the, the key point of view is that many curvature flows can be viewed as a minimization of some energy. We have some energy, some function E, which assigns a score or a value to any surface F using things like area, volume, mean curvature, and so forth. And then if we want to start with an initial surface and smooth it out, then we can just try to reduce the curvature, move the vertices in a way that brings this score down until we get to the bottom. How does this work? Well, let's consider an energy E, again, that assigns a score, a value to any immersed surface F. We can reduce the energy by doing gradient descent. Right, we kind of want to wiggle the surface in a way that decreases the energy as quickly as possible. That's what we've been talking about all along. Once we know what that direction is, we actually push the surface in that direction and then we keep doing it. So in the smooth setting, we might say the time derivative of the immersion F is equal to minus the first order variation of energy with respect to F, minus the gradient of energy. I'll just pause this for a sec. So the reason why we just did everything we did earlier today and how this ties in with this next stuff that Kian's talking about is your energy could be as simple as the area of the surface. And so if you want to change the area of the surface by minimizing the energy, you take the gradient of the energy. That's just going to be the gradient of the area. That's exactly what we just did. And that's going to tell you to move in a particular direction, which are all the calculations we just did. So he's, he's doing this. Um, directly after all the stuff we just talked about um, because it does tie directly in. He's about to say something like that. In the discrete setting, all we have to do is replace this derivative in time with a difference. So we just take a finite difference. What are the new positions of the vertices minus the old positions divided by some small time step tau? We want to find new positions such that that quantity is equal to the gradient of energy. To really make this explicit, we have to say that this energy is evaluated at some moment in time. Let's say it's evaluated at the current configuration using the current surface. And then finding the new positions is exactly what we said we would do. We start with the current positions, Fi superscript k, and we subtract a small time step tau times the gradient of the energy with respect to the current position of vertex i evaluated on the current surface. Okay? So let's see how different variations in our sequence give us different kinds of surface flows. We'll start with something very simple, normal flow. So here, the energy is just going to be the enclosed volume of our surface. We start out with a surface that has some volume, and we want to push it in a direction that shrinks that volume as quickly as possible. Well, we know from the smooth setting that we should push it in the normal direction at the same speed everywhere. That's exactly what we did first, right? The variation of volume is in the normal direction. 
And we know that if we take the discrete volume and take its gradient, we get this area vector. So our discrete normal flow just says, go to each vertex, compute its area vector, push the surface a little bit in that direction. And here's an example of what we get. We take the bunny and it starts shrinking and crumpling up. Really? One, one of the things he's doing here, sorry, I keep interrupting. One of the things he's doing, which is slightly different than we did in the first, you know, while I was babbling earlier, is that he's looking at the most efficient way to decrease the volume. When, we, when I was talking about volume gradients, I was looking at the most efficient way to increase volume. I'm not sure why he flipped, because when he first started talking about curvature flow, the bunny got bigger, and now he's looking at ways to decrease things. Um, yeah, of course, it's the same problem. The, if you want to increase something as fast as possible, you compute the gradient. If you want to decrease something as fast as possible, you still compute the gradient, you just go in the negative gradient direction. So it's the same computation, you just take it with a different sign. Volume shrinks really fast. Looks a little bit ugly. It actually doesn't look like it helped us smooth out the surface at all. But it is, it is pretty interesting. We could also try running this flow in the opposite direction. We could try inflating the volume. Right, so now the bunny gets kind of puffed up. Right? And these operations actually can be useful for geometric model, dilation of surfaces, and so on. But OK, it doesn't really help us with smoothing. Let's see what else we can do. So let's go to the next function in our sequence, the next energy, which is the area, the surface area. Just integrate over the surface its area. We know that in the smooth setting, the variation of area is twice the mean curvature normal. And we know in the discrete setting that we can express the mean curvature normal using the Cotan formula. So a very, very simple mean curvature flow is go to each vertex, apply the Cotan formula to get this mean curvature vector, and push the surface a little bit in that direction. And here's what that looks like. It, it starts to smooth out the surface, but then what you notice is that the flow is, is pretty singular and degenerate. Little corners start to pinch off, and it develops this funny skeleton. If this were in the smooth setting, actually, basically what would happen is the flow ceases to be well-defined. In the discrete setting, we can just keep going because, well, numerically, every triangle always has an area. We can always try to take a gradient. And you notice it does what we asked it to do. It really shrunk the area a lot. We end up going down to basically zero area. And people do use this kind of thing actually to, to generate, for instance, skeletons of three-dimensional models or variations of this technique to get kind of shape skeletons. Another thing that mean curvature flow is very useful for is solving plateaus problem. So plateau problem is find a surface of smallest area with given boundary, or what's called a minimal surface. So the perfect uh, analogy here, actually perfect, perfect thing that this models is soap films. If I take some pieces of wire, here I have two loops of wire and I dip them into soapy water and I pull them out, I'm gonna get some kind of bubble that meets the wire at the boundary, and, and here I get this, this beautiful shape. So I can use mean curvature flow to predict or model the shape of these soap films. So here's two cylinders experiencing mean curvature flow. Now you notice something interesting happened here. On the right, I got a picture that looks like the photograph. I got this kind of catenoid surface. But on the left, I got this sort of degenerate feature again. What, what happened there? Well, in, in some sense, the soap film figured out that the way to minimize the area while having this boundary is not to have a film along the tall sides of the cylinder, but to instead have a disconnected surface consisting of two disks. And both of those are surfaces whose boundary is two circles, but one of them has much smaller surface area. And what would happen physically if you did this, if you separated these two loops of wire, is that long, thin strand in the middle would just kind of pop. It would just break apart and you get two disjoint disks. Right? And you can keep playing around with this for different surfaces or different boundaries. So here, I just take part of a cube and I get a satellite surface, or I take a box, I cut some holes in it, and minimize the surface area and I get this very nice smooth surface. And this is the kind of thing that might be used for geometric modeling, for connecting up different pieces of a surface nicely. I hope that, that was clear, especially the, the two loop of wire. It's a classic example. If I have these two loops of wire 
and I have them really close together, the soap will actually do this physically. If you dip it into soap and pull it out, you'll get this kind of cylinder in the middle. But if you do that again and those wires are further apart, well, maybe you'll see a longer cylinder. But at some point, if the loops are far enough apart, you dip them in and pull them out, you just see those two disks. Um, and the, the mathematics exactly gives you that solution. It's amazing. If I have two circles and I put them in and I look and I minimize the mean curvature, use this mean curvature flow, you do get this solution that's here um, that he has indicated. But when the loops are far enough apart, you get a different solution, which are those two disks. It's amazing how much the mathematics mimics what you see in nature there. And same thing with this um, kind of bent cubical loop of wires, the surface you get is exactly the surface you would get if you were to dip that into soapy water. It's a classic problem he mentioned called Plateau's problem. I don't think he says this, I'll let it play in a sec, but um, one of the things that we proved along the way here, since um, the mean curvature gives you the way, the mean curvature flow gives you the way to decrease area, it means that minimal area surfaces must have mean curvature zero. The mean curvature at any point is not zero, then there'd be a direction where you can decrease the area. So this is one of the fundamental results of differential geometry is that mi so-called minimal surfaces, surfaces of minimal area for a given boundary, they have mean curvature zero everywhere. So soap, soapy water, is a physical apparatus by which you can find a surface that has mean curvature zero at every point. It's one way to characterize soap films, is that at every point they have mean curvature zero. It's kind of cool. Okay, so let's keep going and let's look at Gauss curvature flow. Here our energy is the integral of mean curvature. We know the variation of this energy, the gradient of this energy is the Gauss curvature normal, Kn. And in the discrete setting, we can write the corresponding discrete curvature flow as, well, you go to every vertex, you compute the discrete Gauss curvature normal, so dihedral angles divided by edge lengths times edge vectors, you push the surface a little bit in that direction. So what do we expect to happen here? I mean, what, what does it look like to reduce the total mean curvature of a surface? Maybe stop and think about that, given what you know now about mean curvature, what do you think this should look like? Okay, so we know that mean curvature at a point measures the average amount of bending in any direction. So it seems that if I minimize total mean curvature, I should be reducing the average bending in any direction, right? Well, let's see what, let's see what happens here. So here's our bunny again, we run the flow. Ah! Oh God! Right? Not good. So we definitely didn't make the surface smoother. It kind of blew up in a nasty way. Why is that happening? The first impulse is to think, oh, maybe this is just a numerical artifact. Maybe the discretization isn't very good. Things just break down when we work with a triangle mesh rather than a smooth surface. Actually, the real reason is because mean curvature is a signed quantity. So to minimize mean curvature, we should try to make it as negative as possible. Right, so actually the magnitude of curvature can increase if we're trying to minimize the total mean curvature. So this Gauss curvature flow really doesn't make sense for general surfaces. One place that it does make sense is for convex surfaces. So here's Gauss curvature flow on an icosahedron. And there's a very nice story actually about Gauss curvature flow um, that for convex surfaces, you can think of it in analogy to throwing a stone down a hill. So as you imagine you take a convex stone, you toss it off the top of an extremely tall hill and it starts rolling and bouncing down the hill. Whenever it hits a side, a little piece of the stone is gonna get chiseled off and it's gonna smooth out the surface more and more and more and it's gonna to tend to hit places that have sharper corners more often. So this is a very nice perspective described in an article by uh, Ben Andrews um, with a title involving 
uh, the fate of Rolling Stones. Okay, some nice things to say about Gauss curvature. Unfortunately, it's not a useful flow for surface smoothing. So what do we do? We, we're kind of done with our sequence. We can't go on to the next one, right? If we try to minimize Gauss curvature, we're just gonna get zero. Well, there's plenty of other curvature energies, curvature functionals that we can look at to smooth out a surface. And one that is really nice and kind of the first one that really works is the Wilmore energy, which is the integral not of mean curvature, but of mean curvature squared. So here we're really gonna penalize any bending at all, whether it's positive or negative. The nice thing is we can actually already write down a, a good version of discrete Wilmore energy using our mean curvature vector. Right? We have this mean curvature vector that's given by the Cotan formula. And to get a discrete Wilmore energy, I'm just gonna take the norm squared of that vector and divide by the area of the dual cell. Why, by the way, am I dividing by area and why am I doing it only once? That's a good thing to think about. Well, again, the mean curvature normal is really the integral of mean curvature over a vertex neighborhood. So if I want to integrate mean curvature squared over the whole surface, then I kind of have a factor of area squared in that norm squared term. I have to cancel one of them out to do an integral with respect to surface area. Okay. If I now apply this flow, I'm not going to write down explicitly the expression for the gradient. It gets a little complicated. But if I now write down this flow in the discrete setting and see what it does to my surface, aha, finally it does what I imagined. It takes the surface, it smooths out all the small details, it leaves the rough shape. If I kept running this long enough, maybe it would turn into a, a round sphere, right? It'd be like a blob of water that's becoming a, a spherical droplet under surface tension. In fact, this Wilmore energy does model pretty accurately a lot of physical phenomena, like the membrane energy of a cell, a bilipid membrane. It can also be used as a bending force for things like water droplets, or for things like flat elastic plates. Okay, so these curvatures, as we discussed at the very beginning of our lecture on, on curvature, really play an important role in the natural world. And that's why we wanted to talk about how to discretize them, how to minimize them, and so forth. If you want to read more about kind of algorithms and applications for curvature flow, here's just a random sampling of a bunch of interesting papers that touch actually on a lot of the things we talked about. For instance, mean curvature becoming singular and how do you deal with that? Or how do you use the mean curvature normal to define Wilmore energy? Or how do you come up with a version of Wilmore energy that better captures some of the structures that we see in the discrete setting? All right, that's it for now. Talk to you next time. Anybody have any questions? I'm not sure, Catherine, I'll have to talk about this. I'm not sure where we're at, Catherine, with our next set of assignments. Um, the we said the previous one will be due, the written part of assignment four was gonna be due Thursday. Um, we're I made not, the executive decision to change it to Friday because I forgot to update the um, website until just now. So Friday enough. night, yep. Okay. So the rent, so we've now covered all the material you need to do that written assignment. A couple of those questions were about these geometric derivatives. So hopefully what, what we went through in class today will help you do those questions if you choose to do them. Um, and then um, on Thursday, we're gonna start into the Laplacian, which will bring us, get us into our next set of us, both coding assignment and written assignment. I think the coding assignment and the written assignment, the next one will only rely on what we're going to do this Thursday, which means those two assignments are going to happen, you know, next week, shortly after we complete Thursday, we'll move right into those two assignments.
Good. Kathy, you want to add anything? Um, I'll just add uh, one of my personal favorite um, geometry papers is the, um, just in terms of like its elegance, is the implicit bearing paper that Keenan uh, mentioned at the end of that talk. Um, it's by De Bruyne et al. It's like 1999 or so. Huh. Um, and you can, like, given the assignment that you just turned in, the coding assignment that you just turned in, you could, in like a few lines of code, basically implement that paper um, if you are curious to do so. Um, and it's a good exercise um, in terms of like figuring out like different time steps and stuff like that that'll make your um, updates of the surface be numerically stable. It's something we haven't talked about in this class yet, but it's like a huge um, topic of discussion for people that actually do geometry processing. So um, if you want to like smooth out some surfaces, um, you already have most of the toolbox to do that in your code right now. And it's kind of fun. So. There was one other thing I wanted to say, this, this topic of smoothing surfaces, it's really important. If you guys, I, mean, I do a lot of 3D scanning and 3D printing. And part of the problem with 3D scanning is you always get some noise. So the object you're trying to capture that you're trying to do something with always has a lot of bumpiness to it, which is not part of the original object. You want to get rid of that by smoothing the object. And obviously you want to do that in some kind of algorithmic way. If you then want to make copies of it and 3D print it and try to replicate your original object or deform it to animate it, you've got character animators who will actually make a physical sculpture of a little clay model. And the modern claymation is they'll scan this little physical sculpture and then they'll animate it on screen. But they've got to get an accurate scan first. I mean, there's zillions of uses for smoothing, which we, we keep talking about. Um, and um, it's like one of the most important tasks that you do in this area. And I'll just add one of the things that um, has been really excited about exciting about the field of geometry in the last 10 years or so is that we've seen development of hardware, like scanning tools um, and stuff like that, that actually like really require some of this um, applied geometry that beforehand was just sort of like people figuring out the discrete case for all this like continuous math, uh, all these, you know, stuff like that. And, and one consequence of that is that, you know, when you look at qualities, for example, of 3D scans, um, a lot of what makes a really good mesh isn't just that it's accurately representing the underlying potentially smooth surface, but that even the triangulations themselves are arranged in such a way that um, when you go and you do things like compute the discrete curvature or something, or discrete mean curvature, or discrete Gaussian curvature, that the actual arrangement of the points in space are such that when you do things like compute that, that gradient or compute the cotangent of those angles, that the, no angle is like so small that you're dividing by a really small number or whatever. So you're getting like floating point issues of, you know, just like stuff that comes out of the numerics that has nothing to do with the surface itself can impact the stability of algorithms like this implicit varying algorithm. So I think it's kind of interesting because it, it brings kind of end to end a bunch of these different aspects of like both computer science, um, hardware, uh, scanning, image processing, geometry processing, all like in like one kind of package, which I think is pretty cool. All right, we'll see you all Thursday. Bye. Bye.